In today's video, we're going to look at 10 players that I have way higher than the industry, okay? Because Fantasy Pros does ECR, Expert Consensus Ranking. So anyone you've ever watched a video from, anyone that you have heard a podcast from, anyone that you have read a blog post from, does their rankings on Fantasy Pros. And they collect it, do the averages, and it becomes ECR. So I could see what my rankings are relative to the rest of the industry and people that are you know on top of fantasy football at this time of the year. So today we're looking at 10 players, again, that I have way higher than ECR. And I'm going to be honest, this is the first time I've actually looked at my rankings this summer relative to ECR. And you're going to be surprised by some of the names on this list because I was equally surprised. And there have been some guys that I've been shitting on all summer that we have now took out the full roll of toilet paper and wiped the shit off of, okay? That's good. I'm, I'm happy to actually see that, that it's not just the same dudes. It is a lot of the same guys that I like over and over and over again. But I still think me staying on top of the players and their movement is beneficial to all of you guys because it's not just we hate a single player. We just don't like where they're currently being drafted or where they have been drafted. I still rank them highly relative to other people. And that's the beauty of, of fantasy football. You know, I can literally hate where a guy is being drafted, but as soon as he drops a round or two, he's he's my boy. It's like that. It's like a friend that you can't bring to anything serious, right? Like you'll never come to a family event, never come into a double date. But if I got a party, if we got a rager on Saturday night, he's coming with. Change of circumstances, change of scenery is everything. And I know based on the thumbnail, y'all thought I was going to clown Mason. No, 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 no. Me and Mason, Mason's actually kind of the goat. He's my homie. We've spent uh, a good amount of time together. That's actually a lie. We just spent one long, intimate weekend in uh, Arizona together earlier this year. Paulus. How you doing? All right. We're going to get into it because this intro is long as fuck. You know, I came tucked already. And the way we're going to do this list, which was suggested by someone in the comments on a video, maybe last month or so, I'm going to work my way up. So the list is basically created by the number of spots in which I'm differed to ECR. Okay. So we're going to start with the lowest guys that are still very high that are all within the top 100. And then we're going to work our way to the number one, like biggest differential player. So we'll start on the bottom of the list. And that is DJ Moore of the Chicago Bears. I have him ranked 20th overall, which is 15 spots higher than ECR. And this is half PPR rankings. This is one quarterback leagues. With DJ Moore, I just think he's done so, so well with the little that he's had uh, throughout his NFL career. I don't know if there's anyone who showed as much. He's like a, a Mike Evans light at this point. And then he finally hit a ceiling last year with, you know, you want to call it the best quarterback he's played with in Justin Fields? Probably not, but he just went crazy with Justin Fields, was the wide receiver six in fantasy football. Now he gets Caleb Williams, all right? So I don't want to overthink it with Keenan Allen, who is an aging veteran whose separation skills have gone down a, a little bit. And then we have Roma Dunze, who is a rookie, and it's going to take him some time to, like, get into this offense. So you now have the best quarterback. You now have a really, really good player on a contract extension in a good offense, all right? So DJ Moore is a guy I love. If you can get him at the end of the second round, that's probably early. If you're in a home league right now, you could probably get him early third round, mid third round, maybe even late third round. If he's my wide receiver two or even three, if you go super wide receiver heavy, I am ecstatic about that. So far in the preseason, he has played every single snap with the starters. He is the wide receiver one. When they're in 13 personnel, he is one of the two outside wide receivers when they're in 12. And then obviously he's on the field when they're 11. So he is he is the one there, okay? 15 spots higher than ECR. Next guy up on this list, another receiver, is Cooper Cup. I have him 17th overall, which is also 15 spots higher than ECR. ECR has him down at 32, which is an end-ish of the third round. And I might be a little bit overly optimistic about this Rams offense because I like Kyron Williams. I like Poop Nakua. I really like Matt Stafford, obviously. I've been taking a lot of Jordan Whittington in the end of best ball drafts. I had a lot of Demarcus Robinson earlier on in the offseason. So a lot to like about the Rams offense. And I think the biggest thing with Cooper Cup is I really don't expect him to be the one this year. I expect Puka Nakua to outscore him and outplay him and outproduce him. However, Cooper Cup really didn't stand a chance going into last year. He had the hamstring setback like four days before the season started. He never really had a chance to get anything going last season. And so far, it's not that like reports have been great out of Rams camp about Cooper Cup and how good he has looked and back to his old self. But it's the fact that he's made it the entire summer without a calf strain or a hamstring pull or any of these minor injuries. Like he has just been fully healthy the entire offseason. And typically that's a really big part of the season to get through in order to stay healthy for the season because you see a lot of muscle strains happen early on when players are just getting ramped back up into serious, serious exercise. So the guys who take their offseason workouts really seriously tend to have way less of uh, an injury 
risk going into the year. So if you can get through those, you know, four to eight weeks in the preseason and not pulling a hamstring or not pulling a groin or not pulling a calf or whatever, a lot of the times your likelihood of doing that during the season diminishes to, to a very, very high degree. So love what we've heard about Cooper Cup throughout camp. And I just think this offense is going to run through strictly Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua in the passing game. So those two should combine to see, you know, about 20 targets a game. Moving on up the list, uh, we have James Cook. He's my 27th ranked player which is just outside the first two rounds. You're talking about like the 303-ish, 16 spots higher than ECR. When I look at what he did last year, it was so impressive from a fantasy perspective, from a yardage pr perspective, just from like a production perspective. Based on like going into the year, we didn't really know how they were going to use him. Then they decided to use him as a workhorse. And that has been the case throughout the entire preseason so far. If Josh Allen has been on the field, then James Cook has been on the field for 100% of snaps. Like they're leaving no scraps to nobody behind James Cook. And I think when you look at Gabe Davis gone and Stefan Diggs gone, the amount of targets where this offense needs to start dispersing to in a very creative offense with what they have going on there with Joe Brady. I think he's going to see a minimum of two to three screen targets per game. And that might seem like a low number, but realistically running backs, I think the highest running back number last year in terms of screens per game was Brees Hall at 1.7. This is one of those things where like uh, it's all like offseason buzz where, oh, this guy's going to get five screens a game. This guy's going to run 30 percent of his uh, snaps from the slot. It never happens. Like when you actually look at the numbers, there's nothing even close to saying that that evidence is real or it's going to happen. With James Cook, I don't think they're going to have a choice but to actually push the offense through him. It's going to be him, Don Kincaid, and another player that we will get to at the top of this list. But I just think he's going to catch, you know, 60, 70 passes this year. Do I think he's going to be utilized on the goal line? Not much more than he was last year, although he was kind of unlucky on the goal line last year. I think his number right now in underdog fantasy is four and a half rushing touchdowns. So they do expect him to be a little bit better on the goal line, which is good. But I also think they're going to use him on wheel routes. I think they're going to use him on outside plays. I think they're going to use him all over the formation. So James Cook, I would be happy having him as my RB2 in in, in this year's fantasy drafts. Next up on this list, we've got uh, a, a rookie wide receiver, and this is quickly going to become the theme of this list. And again, I tried to, if, if I went deeper in the rankings, there were bigger significant gaps. Like if I were to go to my 111th ranked player or something, there were guys that I was like 75 spots higher on than ECR. But I wanted to stick within the top 100 to get like real good talking points around guys that I think will really like win leagues or impact the way that you are drafting this year. And Brian Thomas Jr., I have ranked 92 overall, which I don't think that doesn't feel high. And that's probably because I've been drafting on underdog a lot this offseason. But that is 17 spots higher than ECR. So 92 overall is the beginning of the middle of the eighth round, I want to say. That doesn't feel, again, that doesn't feel like a reach. It doesn't feel high. It feels like exactly where BTJ should go. And if he falls there, that is where I'll be drafting him in drafts this year. You look at BTJ and just who he is as a prospect. I think he's one of those guys that's going to have a massive second half of the year explosion as a rookie. This dude is 6'3", 210 pounds, ran a 4'3", 3, 3. Like, that is so unbelievably explosive in an offense that is now lacking pretty much any downfield playmaking ability because Calvin Ridley's gone. So it's Kirk and Ingram, and I like both of them. They're both fine, but they're like middle-of-the-field play-action rollout, going across the middle-of-the-field type targets. They are not downfield stretchers and downfield playmakers, okay? So you got Ridley gone, Zay Jones gone. Now, Jacksonville is entering the year with the second most vacated air yards, over 3,000 vacated air yards from last season, the fifth most overall targets available, and the highest rate of vacated targets inside the 10-yard line, okay? So 56.3% of their inside the 10-yard line targets last year are now gone. On paper, Brian Thomas Jr. hits every single one of those Marks. Okay, you're talking about inside the 10-yard line. Brian Thomas Jr. led the NCAA with 17 receiving touchdowns last year. Trevor Lawrence attempted the third most deep pass attempts, 20-plus yards down the field last year. Okay, that is where Brian Thomas can thrive. So I'm really excited to see the fit here because T-Law wants to open it up. He wants to sling the ball downfield. He just doesn't have the requisite playmakers to do so. And BTJ, plus Gabe Davis coming in three years, $39 million contract, he will play a lot. He might even play more than Brian Thomas over the first half of the year, but that will swap eventually, and they'll start to see that like BTJ offers a type of electricity on this on this offense that Gabe Davis simply does not. But even through these preseason games so far, Brian Thomas at worst has been playing about eighty percent of the snaps with T. Law. So there's a chance that he starts off as a full time play playmaker uh, immediately for the Jaguars, which is really fun to spot to be in uh, at pick ninety two. Now we want to talk about we want to talk about guys that I've done nothing but put 
my pants down and exudes the food that I've had over the last 24 hours onto someone's chest. It's Xavier Worthy. Xavier Worthy is, I think, the fifth player on this list. I have him ranked 70th overall, which is like the 6'10". You will never get him there in underdog. Uh, the last underdog draft I did, he is now a fourth round pick, which I think is still outrageous. But according to ECR, where ECR I think is way more home league friendly. It's way more, you know, running backs get pushed up. Rookies take a little bit of a backseat. It's way more practical towards your actual leagues, in my opinion. Xavier Worthy, I have ranked 70th. That is 18 spots higher than ECR. When you look at Hollywood Brown's injury, I think he'll be back week two, maybe week three at the latest. But overall, like it would just be irresponsible of me to completely just fade Xavier Worthy at this point, given the opportunity that he's going to have, given the fact that Hollywood Brown is hurt, given the fact that he's played so much throughout the preseason with Patrick Mahomes, given the fact that he's playing with Patrick Mahomes. Okay. They need a real field stretcher. I still think when all is said and done and everything settles out, Worthy will be more of a gadgety player where they take shots to downfield or they just pepper it off to him around the line of scrimmage. He won't be like a real possession receiver, especially competing with targets, Rashi Rice, Travis Kelsey, Hollywood Brown, et cetera. Uh, but right now, like end of the sixth round, given the opportunity, I'm fine with that. So I was shocked. I thought I would just be like normal ranked, even lower maybe than ECR. That's not the case. I'm 18 spots higher, which is fucking crazy. As we go down the list, the next player, I'm also 18 spots higher on, and that is Dalton Kincaid. This, this list is actually like 30% Buffalo Bills players. I am 18 spots higher on Dalton Kincaid then ECR. I have them all the way up at 48. So you're talking about the 412, where ECR has them all the way down at like the middle of the sixth round. You ain't getting Don Kincaid in the middle of the sixth round. This is maybe less to me about the upside. Actually, that's not true because I think Don Kincaid is number one overall tight end upside. I think with the amount of vacated targets that I talked about with James Cook, and we'll talk a little bit more about with one of the players higher up on this list, there's so much opportunity from Josh Allen's arm to find somebody else's chest, okay? And Dalton Kincaid's going to be a massive part of this offense and the just disposal of targets and where they're going to go. So I think he has a chance to be a red zone weapon. I think he has a chance to stretch the seam. I think he has a chance to be a dude that goes – you know, consistently six for 85 and a touchdown, like week in and week out. And those are difference making numbers at the tight end position. But I also think a lot of this ranking is what I've been projecting to you guys all summer is that I want to leave my drafts with one of the big five tight ends, whether that is Laporta, Kelsey, Andrews, McBride, or Dalton Kincaid, one of those five. And Kincaid seems to typically be the fifth one of those five to go off your draft board. So I wanted to rank him higher then ECR, then overall consensus. So at worst, you are getting, I think, a really good value on the back of the first tier. All right. So it's one of the reasons I've been like vehemently against Sam Laporta is not because of the player, but because of the fact that you have to take him two to three rounds higher than a dude like Dalton Kincaid, where of course, Sam Laporta's floor is probably higher, but I would say that their ceilings are likely near each other okay so Don Kincaid is the next guy up on this list again 18 spots higher now we're getting to the 20 spot all right which is significant because again all these players are ranked within the top 100 so 20 spots is like a massive massive ratio percentage change and it's another tight end and this one actually surprised me because I talked about the top five tight ends I apparently like Kittle way more than ECR does all right I have him as my 58th ranked player 20 spots higher than ECR. And it's the same narrative every year with George Kittle. There's too many weapons in San Francisco. He's going to get hurt. And then every year, I'm looking back at the rankings for fantasy tight ends. This previous year, he was the tight end five. In 2022, he was the tight end two. In 2021, he was the tight end four. In 2020, it was the only year, right? We want to talk about George Kittle always being banged up and always being hurt. 2020 was the only year that he played fewer than 14 games. Like, he's almost always out there. Yes, he's banged up, but so is every fucking football player. So you have tight end five last year, tight end two, tight end four. The one year he's hurt, 2019, tight end two, 2018, tight end three. He's literally just Travis Kelsey light. Like, when he's on the field, he is producing at a very high level. You guys all try to get like, oh, the consistency here. It's the fucking tight end position, dude. If you're going to tell me that a guy that I'm drafting is just going to end up as a top four tight end at the end of the year, yeah, I'm going to welcome him onto my team. Now, he and Brock Purdy also have just phenomenal chemistry. Uh, since he's come into the league, Kittle has averaged 14.3 
full PPR fantasy points per game with Brock Purdy. It is a stark contrast with him having a real quarterback getting the ball thrown to him. Next dude up on this list, another rookie wide receiver, Roma Dunze. I have him 73rd overall. So you're talking about in the seventh round, that is 23 spots higher than ECR. This pretty much assures you that if you're following our rankings, uh, you are getting Roma Dunze in your drafts. And he is one of the more obvious like second half of the year breakout. You talk about that with Brian Thomas, like Roma Dunze is right there in that list. Like I said, if you're following our rankings, then you will probably have a lot of Rome on your teams. This year, the rankings are available and updated in real time, live time throughout now until the NFL kickoff on bdge.co. That's where you can get the draft guide at full price, but you can get it for a discounted price, a very, very heavily discounted price by simply signing up on the Underdog Fantasy app with our code BDGE and depositing $10. So very discounted, $10 on Underdog Fantasy using code BDGE. If you're a first-time depositor, you'll get the draft guide emailed to you, access for free. You will get a free square of half a yard for any player that you want to pick on Underdog Fantasy for week one. So you're getting a, a completely just guaranteed winning bet for week one. And you will get a deposit bonus up to $1,000, depending on how much you end up depositing. $10. Not going to get you a thousand, but it's going to get you damn close. All right. So it's the best deal of fantasy right now. BDGE.co, full price, underdog fantasy for a heavy discount using code BDGE. Roma Dunze will end up on your teams if you are following those rankings. So, very much going off of like DJ Moore is their one, and Keenan Allen has not looked good. The vibes around Keenan Allen this offseason have not been great either. So, if I am pushing that agenda and I'm a fan of Caleb Williams, which I am, and I think he's going to have a phenomenal rookie year, then Rome seems to be the next guy up to you know take a step. And I think this offense is going to be pretty three wide receiver heavy. You have this roster of Rome and Keenan and DJ Moore, and like, sure, Keenan's a, a veteran and he's seasoned and he might play more snaps in two wide receiver sets, but Rome and Caleb are coming into the league together. So there's a natural chemistry that's going to be built up between them two that I think will showcase way earlier – or way more often, maybe down the stretch than I should say, uh, than a dude like Keenan Allen. And if Keenan Allen, the weight concerns are real, then his conditioning is going to be a problem over the second half of the year. All right. So we're going to Rome and we're going Rome heavy. I also just right now realized that this list is 12 players, not 10. So voila, you get you get a little bit more of uh, of me yapping. Next guy up on this list, we have Trey McBride. I just like these top tier tight ends, man. This doesn't feel like a year I'm waiting on tight ends. I, I don't want Cole Komet. I don't want... Dallas Goddard. I don't want those guys as my starters in my lineup. I want guys like Trey McBride. I have him as the 30th overall ranked player, 23 spots higher than ECR. Uh, the Cardinals, like as bad teams do, they they thought that starting Zach Ertz over McBride last year was a good move. That worked for seven weeks. It didn't work, or they, they, they forced it to try to work for seven weeks. Didn't Zach Ertz, predictably at age fucking 40, coming off an ACL tear, got hurt, did not play another snap. McBride stepped in, never looked back. You look at Trey McBride's production after the Zach Ertz injury, 14.95 PPR points per game. For context, Travis Kelsey led tight ends last year in scoring 14.8 PPR fantasy points per game. Sam Laporta averaged 13.8 PPR fantasy points per game. McBride did this while scoring just three fucking times, okay? Love McBride this year. Sure, Marvin Harrison is going to come in and command 140 targets. I just think that means the offense is going to be better. Kyler is healthy, and the chemistry between them was beautiful down the stretch. The chemistry between McBride and Kyler from a numbers perspective. Trey McBride's first read target rate was 31.8%. That ranked number one amongst the entire tight end position by a wide margin. So in my opinion, just with a very condensed target share, Kyler throwing to Marvin Harrison Jr., Trey McBride, and some to Michael Wilson. Like, I am fine with the addition of Marvin Harrison Jr. to Trey McBride's plate there, and I think they could both eat. Number 10 player up on this list is Rashi Rice. I have him all the way up at 37, so you're talking about the first pick of the fourth round, but again, I would not argue if you wanted to take him at the end of the third round. I have him 25 spots higher than ECR. So I won't go too deep into this just because if you've watched any of my videos over the last two weeks, it's pretty much been yelling at you that Rashi Rice needs to be on every single one of your teams. And when you look at what he did last year, he's the first receiver to go over 935 yards with Patrick Mahomes since Tyreek Hill. He did that while playing on 60% of snaps. He did that while not being a real player until like the second half of the season. When you look at his splits from week one through eight versus the second half of the season, this dude was averaging over 16 PPR fantasy points per game. The number of touchdowns uh, and the number of end zone looks he was getting was 
kind of startling. Like he became Mahomes' and this is not hyperbole, number one target over the back half of the season. Like these are the numbers from weeks eight through eighteen versus Kelsey. Same number of games, more targets, more receptions, more receiving yards, more touchdowns, more red zone targets, more PPR points by a wide margin. At this point, it doesn't look like anything's happening with a legal case, at least not this year. So that is not a concern. And that was the major concern earlier in the offseason. But the closer we get to kickoff, the less likely anything like that is going to happen. So Rashi Rice, with the additions of Hollywood and Xavier Worthy, spreading the field downfield leaves that middle part of the field so wide open where I think Rashi Rice could catch 100 passes this year. And my top two spots, my guys that I am so much higher on than consensus, it is unfathomable. It makes me sick. First guy up. Jerome Ford. Okay. I have him 86th, 86th, 26 spots higher than ECR. I've talked a lot about Jerome Ford. And a lot of this comes on the back of when I flip this list. If you guys, if you guys like what I did for this video and want me to do the reverse, like guys that I am the lowest on compared to ECR, I could do that tomorrow. Someone comment down below that you want to hear that. If it gets, if it gets 500 thumbs up on that comment, then I'll make that list. But on that list, Nick Chubb is my number one player in terms of being lower than ECR. And I've been telling you guys that all offseason. I don't know when he's going to step onto the field. He was officially put onto the pup list yesterday. Jonathan Brooks this morning. Give myself a quick pat on the back. It's crazy again because, like, we saw them walking less. I thought they were paralyzed. That's crazy, right? Like, that's the way people in fantasy act. They're like, oh, I saw him walking. Like, oh, he's fine. He can squat. He can run. Like, there's science behind this, you fucking Neanderthals. All right? Jerome Ford. He is a dude that's going to open up as the workhorse in Cleveland. That might be a great role. It remains to be seen if Deshaun Watson can run a functional offense. That is my biggest concern here. They do have uh, a lot healthier of an offensive line. Still some injury concerns even going into the year. But last year, like both their tackles got hurt. Their entire off off offensive line went to shit. And Jerome Ford still produced as a relatively good back. They also have other injuries in their backfield. Uh, and I just don't know like who else is going to be active on game days behind Jerome Ford. So I think at least for those first four weeks, and again, being on the pup doesn't even mean that you're missing just four weeks. Like Nick Chubb could theoretically sit through six weeks or eight weeks or whenever he's actually ready to be back on the field. But it's a minimum of four weeks, a minimum of four weeks of Jerome Ford being the workhorse there in Cleveland. He is explosive. It's going to be more of a spread offense that I also think kind of like leans into a little bit of his strength as a pass catching back. But yeah, Jerome Ford, I'm 26 spots higher on than ECR and the number one player who I am significantly higher on than the experts out there. Then you clown ass experts is rookie wide receiver, early second round pick, Buffalo Bill, Keon Coleman. I have him ranked 90th overall, 27 spots higher than ECR. And like I said, this list has some rookie fever on it, which it should. This is a fantastic receiver class with a ton of like really talented, explosive players that went to great quarterback situations. Rome to Caleb Williams, Brian Thomas to Trevor Lawrence, Keon Coleman to Josh Allen, Xavier Worthy to Patrick Mahomes. Like love the early talent of Malik Neighbors, Daniel Jones, tough one to sell me on. Marvin Harrison going to Kyler. A lot of these rookies who are talented went to great situations where we don't have to worry about the quarterback play. If we just think they're talented, then that's going to show because the quarterback won't be the problem in their system. So in my opinion, this isn't a normal year really, and you're going to want to take shots on these rookies in the second half of your single digit round drafts. Or if you're in a home league where these guys drop into the ninth, 10th, 12th round or whatever, these should be your targets. Again, you lose Diggs and you lose Gabe Davis, the two most targeted wide receivers on this team in each of the past two seasons. You also look at Curtis Samuel is now dealing with the turf toe which they say is week to week, but that is typically like a month long injury that also lingers into the season will likely be a problem for the whole season. MVS is also hurt and questionable for week one. So Keon Coleman has played every single down with the starters so far this offseason, right? I said that for James Cook and pretty much for Dalton Kincaid. Keon Coleman is the only other player right now that has played 100% of the snaps with the starters. So if you think he's talented, He's in a situation with crazy opportunity, and he's running basically every route with the starting team and Josh Allen. So, like, he has to be real. He has to be like Quentin Johnson not to produce this year. Okay. That would be the comp. If he doesn't produce, then it's Quentin Johnson level. But if he does, like, if he's any good, which he's already shown to be better because Quentin Johnson couldn't crack the starting lineup until everybody died last year and it was like week 12, Keon's going to start off the rip as one of their top receivers and probably see anywhere from like five to seven targets a game. He's an explosive downfield play, playmaker that could take those targets and turn them into 
high levels of fantasy production, all right? So down at pick 90, I don't think is that crazy, but apparently ECR sees it differently, all right? They see a lot of shit differently. So again, if someone wants to see this list reversed, guys that I am way lower on than ECR, drop the comment. Gang of people got to hit the thumbs up button down there. Regardless, I love y'all for hanging out. Thank you for watching the videos this summer. If you still got drafts remaining, Hit the draft guide, bdge.co, full price, very heavily discounted through underdogfantasy.com or the Underdog Fantasy app. That link will be the first in the show notes. Use code BDGE when you deposit for the first time. I'm out of here. I'll see you all tomorrow. Smoke cheese.